everybody, this is Bridget Danner with Women's Wellness Collaborative, and I'm here with Kate Stillman of YogaHealer.com. So first of all, just a big thank you to those of you who are here live. We really appreciate your time, and a thank you to those of you who will watch it later as well. Uh, we've got a great topic today uh, based on Kate's book and program called Body Thrive. So I was calling the topic of this webinar um, 10 Habits Needed to Thrive. And some of you may know Kate and her work already, and some of you may just be getting to know her. So how about we just start off, Kate, with a, a little intro of who you are and what you do and how this Body Thrive 10 Habits concept came to be. Yeah, yeah, and thanks for thanks for having me here and uh, anyone listening now or later. Uh, yeah, nice to meet you. So I was first really into international environmental policy and politics and very much driven from from a young age uh, to help humans become more conscious and more connected to the planet, more connected to each other and just like smarter together. I think early on it was weird because I was a systems thinker even in like high school. It's like trying to find like who understood global problems and there weren't that many people thinking that way then. Um, and there were almost no one my age that I could find that was. And so I went into I went to that path pretty hardcore and then after uh, you know through through high school, college, working then in DC and then I left because I realize that you know human consciousness is often really individual and the paths of particularly the path of yoga helps people wake up so I was like I need to figure all that out too because that seems like a really good piece that it's not just policy it's actually humans being more conscious and so they have to do some work so I'm going to go do that work and learn more about that and uh, in the process of that I knew I wanted to learn a healing system I didn't know the word Ayurveda at the time uh, but I quickly found it and it was funny because I actually because of the whole climate change global warming stuff I ended up learning quite a bit of Chinese and spending time in China so it would much have been easier for me at age now at the ripe age of about 23 24 24 uh, to go into Chinese medicine but Ayurveda had such a strong pull because of that connection with the personal and the planetary with the inner ecosystem and the outer ecosystem I was like oh forget it I'll just start learning Sanskrit instead <laughs> <laughs> Instead of using any of this Chinese background, that just took me like years, but um, it was a good decision because it just, I mean, first of all, it's seamless with yoga. It truly is seamless. It's the other side of the same coin, so there's no seam in the coin, right? So Ayurveda is the path of thrive and on all levels, including physical body, mental, emotional, relational, intuitional, spiritual, right? So it covers a lot. And then uh, yoga is the path to enlightenment. So the idea with yoga is like, how do you, how do you really wake up, and how much time is it going to take? Because anyone on the path, spiritual path of any sort or growth path of any sort, can look back and see like that piece in there took me a while to get right. And so within the path of yoga, there's an assumption that you're going to want to be around a long time <laughs> to get it, and you're going to want to feel great. Because if you don't feel great, you can't do that kind of work, right? There's a level of work you cannot do if you're in healing. Once you're out of healing and you're whole, there's a whole other level of work you can do. So that's what the path of yoga is so much about, is the work that happens when, you know, it, not that it can't begin in healing, it often does, but that there's a whole other level of potentiality. So that's what really brought me in. And what happened was I got good at explaining yoga and Ayurveda to uh, well, Ayurveda to yoga people and yoga to Ayurveda people. And so that really built my platform at yogahealer.com, uh, which I started in 2001. So I've been around a very long time <laughs> in this online world. <laughs> but it keeps gr growing and gaining traction. And it's crazy. Like last, I just was at Podcast Movement 2016 last week in Chicago. So I looked at my stats and I gave a little talk there. And my my number of download episode downloads like just it grew 400 percent in 11 months even though i've been around a long time we're starting to see some explosive growth uh, so to me that's really exciting you know and that's sort of what from then to now is that did i get to the core of it no that's awesome i learned i learned some new things about you i didn't know you originally in the environmental space um that's sort of how i ended up in 
tree. And med Chinese medicine too. Yeah. So at the, you got the tree. I love it. Yeah. And it seems like you. Oh, I didn't know that about you. Yeah. I kind of got into environmental reasons too. Different story, but um, see, I was just noticing from your story, like you were kind of interested in the collective consciousness to change global environmental problems and then you realize you go to the individual but then you created this community which is really interesting as well so uh, and then you learn from your community <laughs> so maybe tell us a little bit more about your community and I, I'm curious too about the early days did you practice Ayurveda one-on-one -on -one for a while and then yeah. realize yeah. it was something a decade. different a decade yeah. Oh, well, wow. yeah yeah so I was uh, I became an Ayurvedic practitioner in uh, 2000, I believe in 2000. Well, actually, I can look. It's on. I put my diplomas on the wall last week. <laughs> What's the date? This is so funny. 2001. Bam. May 2001. I started practicing, and and also teaching yoga and doing panchakarma, which is the detoxification. It's a very in-depth one-on-one detoxification process. By 2002, I was like group cleanses. That's got to be where it's at. Like we got to be able to do so much better together. And so that was my first Yogi Detox. It was actually called the Ayurvedic Spring Cleanse. That didn't have quite the ring to it that Yogi Detox had. So as I got better at naming things, we just renamed it. Um, that course is now 14 years old. Like I still teach the same things, but I've gotten so much better because the tribes inform me of what is applicable, faster, better, more fun, smarter, right? And so we grow, we very much grow together. Uh, in that way. But yeah, what happened with like where body thrive, my book with the 10 habits of Ayurveda and yoga, where that comes from is just basically like banging my head against the wall as a practitioner, seeing that I had a lot of training that was not as helpful as other training may have been to get my clients more well, faster, better in a more fun way. Right. And what I discovered is that because I had the added benefit of being both a group leader in yoga classes where I'd have 20 people in class. I was invited to teach in studios around the country because of the being able to explain Ayurveda so well to yoga teacher training programs. And, and it just interested yoga students who were like, uh, I get that, that I'm changing. Like when I do yoga, I can't eat what I was eating before. And I can't like, some of my relationships aren't really working as well. And, and there was no one really saying like, okay, you guys, this is what happens when you start doing yoga to your body. And this is why you want to eat. You want to start paying attention to Ayurveda because it's basically on, on, it makes it all work. So you don't like open all this stuff up and then put all this junk in your trunk and then open all this stuff up and then put junk in your trunk and your body gets really confused. Instead, you're evolving your habits at the same time, you know, your home habits, your body habits, your sleep habits, your, uh, I mean, everything, your pooping habits, your tongue, your sense organ care, or your tongue scraping, skin care habits, you're evolving those all together. And when that happens, particularly in a group setting, we see massive wellness evolution. We see crazy breakthroughs all the time. It's just the norm. Mm. So you're doing this group detox and you are seeing some individual clients and, and you were teaching yoga teachers or yep, and public similar. yoga classes. And I actually had a, owned a yoga studio for a good five, six years. In there oh, too. okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And you were ranging your head against the wall to, to notice, explain it again. That the, some of well, the, you didn't have the habit. Like, so as an Ayurvedic practitioner, we spent so much time on studying the individual and the root problems of the individual and to the nth degree, like this person has, Ama in their digestive tract, their Pachak Pitta is high, their Udana Vayu is high. For all that, we're going to use this herb and this herb and this herb and this herb together, and we're going to prescribe these kinds of yoga poses that are grounding and bring the energy from up here down that cool the body and detoxify the body simultaneously. And it's super individualized to this person, right? Okay. So the person gets their plan and their herbs and their yoga postures and their lifestyle tips and their dietary tips and all that. Right. And then they go off on their own to like try to go implement and it doesn't happen. Why? Because you're just asking them to change everything in their life alone. <laughs> and take some yeah. really weird smelling herbs from India. Right. <laughs> yeah, I can totally relate. I can I totally relate. I, you know, I was doing Chinese medicine for a long time, which is a whole system with its herbs and all that. But really here in the States, we're often doing just lots of acupuncture. And I did a very physical practice. And then when I started to do more functional medicine and switch to more internal medicine, I was like, nobody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> nobody's doing what I say. 
<laughs> yeah, and it, and I think I had to take a step back, which I'm still kind of taking, um, to kind of figure out the next best way to teach. And some of it, I think, is just with knowledge for me. Yeah. And your, your book is really great in giving the knowledge. But it's like, I, I feel like for me, if sometimes if I can understand the concepts behind something, it's easier yeah. for me to do. That's one way to make change. Um, what you put in your book, there's you know lots of other ways to make change. There's the, the Kaizen concept you talked about. There's the behavioral science. Uh, maybe before we get into the hab habits themselves, talk yeah. a little bit about how you've learned to help people really make change in their habits. Yeah, so I mean, my underlying message right now is like if you want if you want big change fast, and I think we all do because it's fun and it's better and smarter. Right. I'm just like, if you've got a lot of work to do, like, just go do the work because you'll be so psyched. Instead of like trickling it out over a decade, like get it done in a month. Right. Or two or three or get it done in a year instead of 10 years. So when we're talking about that, you know, whether it's like wanting to lose 50 pounds, whether it's like wanting to experience a whole other level of interconnectivity and bliss, like whatever it is. Right? If you want it, like just get it done. So if you want to get it done, get in a group that's doing that with someone mm -hmm. who knows how to help you get there. If you have that, then everything else I'm going to say after this makes sense. But if you don't have that and you're trying to go it alone, like you just made it 10 times harder. So you actually you didn't. You made it 70% um, harder. Like statistically, we know that now. Like if you go it alone versus going in a group on anything that's related to health and wellness and really probably anything is my guess. We just don't have that number yet. You just made it. You just made your success rate go from 10% to 80%. I personally would rather be in the 80% category. Mm. 10% isn't good enough for me to do anything. Like get out of bed in the morning. Like you have a one in 10 chance of succeeding today. I'm like, forget it. I'm going to roll over. But 80%, I'm like, damn, that's a fair shot. That's a fair shot. So let's talk about that a bit. Like why is the group so much more effective? I think because we're at a stage in human evolution that's going to collective leadership. Hmm, interesting. Hmm. So I never it, put those, those two words together, collective leadership. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm an innovator. Like, it's weird. Um, so when I learn a word that's better than any word I have in my vocabulary, it's just like instant adoption, and I use it right away. Um, I believe I pulled that from Mastering Leadership. It's an excellent it's an excellent book. I actually tried to learn so much about it. I put, this is so funny, we have video, but I put the image of what they teach in Mastering Leadership. I just, like, used Mod Podge and, like, put it on a jar so I wouldn't forget their model oh, and that's where I'm learning a lot about collective leadership and I'm like oh that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years I just didn't have a word and now I have the right word so when we have a group that's coming together we know a lot from accountability partnering we know a lot from peer support we know a lot from accountability tracking when we start to put all of those things together we start to enter into what's like a basically an umbrella of skills that are all part of collective leadership when I bring a group together. I'm like, okay, we need everyone. Like we need all parts of all of you because when we are doing this together and, and we all we all know each other's why and what, like why we're here and what we're here to do, uh, something else happens that's otherwise impossible to happen. And it's it's magnificent and it's like, I always say it's like on steroids. I like steroids. Have you? I had Achilles tendonitis. I needed to take steroids and then I had like an athletic event the next day and I could do it. So when things are... Like, whoa, there's this whole other level. There's a fourth dimension. Um, it To me, that's a sign of evolution. Because when, you know, it's like you can look at all those trajectories of like, even just looking at like humans and data usage over time. It's like you hit a certain point and then it skyrockets. It's just the natural curve of evolution is like things like build, 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 and then they skyrocket. So when we can get those kinds of experiences together with people that want to have health breakthroughs, and you get a bunch of people who want to have it with a competent leader who knows how to do it and knows how to collectively lead, you can expect miracles. And so we see it all. So that's what we see all the time. I didn't know that. I mean, like this for me is actually pretty, I look back and I see like, oh, that's what was happening over the years. But now that we know it and name it and can teach to it, uh, it's, it's happening on, on, the, on our next level of competency with it. So, you know, compared to that, compared to like someone who like gets the new Oprah magazine and picks it up and learns like the next way to lose weight and tries to implement whatever's in that magazine article, it's like that's where you look at a really high rate of failure. Mm. What I just described is where you see some of the, you know, on the leading edge rates of success.
Okay, so I think I, I took us off the track a, a bit to ask that question, but I'll put us back on track. So we have we want a group or something. But I think it was good that we went there because I think it really helps people get, you know? Yeah, that's the, 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 it's not just like, oh, Kate says I need a group. It's like, well, no, there's actually like a real synergy that happens in a group that can really move you forward faster, whereas you read some tips or you try to go it alone, it's very easy. I think everyone can relate. It's very easy yeah. to get discouraged. The people around you aren't changing their diet. The people around you aren't going to bed earlier. And you just kind of like have to kind of give up, <laughs> like without even maybe consciously thinking it. Yeah. So... So we got our support system, and then we're going to talk about a little bit about how to make ha make habit change at six, because I think people can also relate to being really excited, and I, I really want to, um, you know, start exercising again, or start to eat a, more salads or whatever, and um, they just they just can't seem to like make make it fit into the life they're currently leading. Yeah. Right. Right. And so because when we change, like this is the thing about habits is like our habits are collective. <laughs> so that's another big thing. We think they're so individual. But when you look around, it's like, is there some people are enabling certain habits? Um, this actually has really come up in a course recently where someone realized how much their friends were enabling their drinking habits. Because when they start wanting to drink with their friends, they go out and party. Their friends were like, we miss you so much. We want you to come back out with us on Friday night. And, you know, the person was like, well, I can't because when I go out with you guys, I drink too much. And then it, it's like ruining my path as a spiritual person, <laughs> like my deal. Right. And so what happened then is like the friends like kind of guilt tripped and begged her and I, you know, again and again and again. And she finally had to say like, you know what, this is where I'm going. If you want, if you want to be friends with me, you have to respect this is where I'm going. Very few people are willing to do that or even aware that that's what's happening. So they start to make habit changes. Like our first habit in Body Thrive is early or later dinner. Now, all of a sudden, family values. Like what are your family values? If you're a mom with kids and your partner gets home at 7 o'clock and you're trying to eat an early or later dinner and they love having their biggest meal at the end of the day and you'd really rather eat at 5, <laughs> like it's going to bring up a lot really fast. And then say you always go out for date night at 8 o'clock with this other couple on Friday nights and like what happens to all of that? So we start to see exactly how the habits that we have now are reinforced by our relationships. So whenever we want to change a habit, we've got to be willing. And there's a there's a chapter in the book on how to evolve habits in relationship. And it's at this point, I'm like this week alone, I've quoted, you know, I've just like pulled for my students, like you guys got to go back and do that stuff. Do the very, very first part of that chapter because you got to start this. These issues don't go away. <laughs> You know, but there's exercises that we can do to actually bring up the conversation. And so one little one little tip in that is just knowing how to ask for support in new habits. So say your desire is to eat at five and say you do want to have an earlier, lighter dinner. You want to have like super salads so that you get better sleep. So you wake up with a lot more energy and a lot more mental clarity and maybe just a lot more connection to your spirit being in a body. And, and that's becoming more important in your life. So you're like, I'm going to do this. Now, what do you do? How do you ask for support? from your partner who doesn't get home till seven, from your friends and that you go on date night with, right? And so there's, it's really simple. You actually can just say like, hey, you guys, I just need you guys to know this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing this. And, and usually like this is how it's going to make me a better person or like help me live the life I want so I can actually be a better friend to you, right? So then you kind of connect it back to how it'll benefit the other person in the long run. And then you make a very simple, very simple, very doable request for support, which might just be something like, can you not call me <laughs> to go party? <laughs> can you just like think twice before you make that phone call? Or can you just support me in doing this habit and then just know when you come home at seven, I will sit down and, and we'll have our normal conversation. And I don't think you'll actually, it'll just be weird for a couple nights, but then it'll probably just be like the new normal and, and we'll still have the same connection and, and maybe even a better connection because I'll probably be more emotionally stable unless. Yeah, you gave an example of that in your book which I thought was really interesting. A mom who wanted to eat earlier but her family eats later and she would eat earlier and then just have tea with them and sort of be their waitress, <laughs> like help, help get them things. I thought which it was really she was doing anyways, right? Like a lot of us <laughs> are doing that anyways where we're like waiting tables and we're trying to eat our more, most nourishing meal of the day too late. 
Yeah, I thought that was really interesting because she said it would always bug her anyways to have to hop up while she was eating, and I feel that way too. It's like, it's sort of, I don't know, I like cooking, but it gets a little stressful when you're the one serving the meal and then, you know, you're eating, so. And you have a two-year-old or an eight-year-old or a, you know what I mean? Or like, a, yeah. Oh, again, yeah, and it's not, and I'm always like, you got two feet, but it took, you know, years <laughs> before she could get her own spoon or water or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 really interesting. Um, so I have a question for you. You have ten habits, and you suggest that people focus on one per week, which is sometimes a technique that I use in in with my clients. Is um, like if you say you're going to eat at five p.m. for the rest of your life, it's like ah. But if you say you're going to do that, or if you even say you don't even have to move it to five, you could just start moving it earlier, and you just focus on that for a week. So do you have people keep doing it the whole 10 weeks yeah. or, okay, yeah. but, but they just kind of focus their intention the strongest. Right. I mean, the thing is, is like when do it's, there's, we do it all sorts of ways, really. Like in the living Ayurveda course, we take a habit a month. Uh, people who've already gone through the 10 weeks, then we like really focus on a habit a month because all of the habits are that deep that you can, mm -hmm. you can get to different levels of competency and depth. But the way we just teach like the concept of Ayurvedic habits is in 10 weeks in the Body Thrive courses and also in the Body Thrive book and in the Body Thrive book clubs. And what it, what we're finding that it does, because in many ways this is just like a big experiment. And now we have, I think, over 500 book clubs around the world. So we're getting data. Wow, right? 500 book clubs. And then I lead, I lead courses and then my coaches lead courses. So the yoga health coaches all lead this 10 week system and there's 120 coaches that are coaching this in their communities and uh, both online and in, in person in different, uh, in different parts of the world. So we have a lot of data. Uh, what we're finding is that the introductory 10 weeks, we are seeing massive breakthroughs. Like we're seeing people losing 30 pounds without effort, like without trying to lose weight without dieting. They're just kind of more intentionally eating an earlier, lighter dinner. I mean, and, and then not snacking and not drinking sugar water between meals, right? So it's not this like strict, and then you're going to eat salad, and then you're going to have soup. But that, you know, it's not like that at all. It's just really just the concept. And then we have, uh, like we, you were saying before with Kaizen, like the what is a 1% improvement a day? What is small incremental change compounding over time? What are the effects of that? And we find that they're astounding. I mean, just it's compound interest. It's just good. It's the interest of good habits that interfold onto each other. So when you eat an early or later dinner and you consciously go to bed earlier and you start working on your hydration and elimination first thing in the morning and you're working on moving more energy in your body before you eat, so you're, you're waking up your breath body, um, all of these little, even if you make a little 1% improvement in each of those categories, they're going to start to have an, an a, basically a compounding effect on each other. Okay. Well, you're sort of hinting at the, some of the 10 habits, so maybe we can get into that. And well, and let me just say, too, a, people go oh, through again and again and again and again. So it's not like, oh, 10 habits, and then you've got it dialed. It's, uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah, now you kind of have an idea of what you should be doing. Yeah, right. I saw that you said to do it potentially every four times a year, like, which yeah. is, I guess, not – every 10 weeks but you get a couple weeks off and then you do it yeah, you again get like a week off a week to set your a week of closure a week to set in your tension and then focus again of just like okay it's early or later dinner week so and what that does is the change we're finding does help of like not having to focus on one thing for so long and then everything slowly starts to get better yeah i really liked that i i i didn't read that and feel intimidated about it at all i was like oh yeah so you just, and you also don't feel like you have to get it perfect the first time it's like well, right. let's give this a whirl. Let's give this a try. And if we're liking it, if we want to, you know, deepen it, like you said, we just do it again. Cool. Um, yeah, I was thinking maybe we could we could uh, frame these 10 habits as if, like, in a day. That way we're not just listing them, perhaps, if, if, if you're yeah. going for that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then I, some of them might not fit in a day exactly like – Right. Your relationships, so uh, we can add those in. Yeah. As as we go. Yeah. So the reason I start with early or later dinner instead of another habit, which we call start the day right, uh, is is because often we kind of we get sick of our own BS during the day, and it, and we feel bad about it at night. 
you know, like those days where you just eat crap or you're, you know, or you're just like over scheduled, you're too busy, you're rushing around and you're just eating on the run and, and you just know, you just know this is not leading well or on, um, or you just haven't exercised that day and you're feeling like a little heavy or dense or sluggish. So instead of being like, oh, tomorrow I'm going to do this and this and this, which is what we tend to do in our mind. It's like, oh, tomorrow I'll exercise. Tomorrow I'm going to eat great salad, sitting down, chewing my food, being mindful. So it's like, no, let's, we, let's just start today. Let's just say tonight, if you're kind of sick of your own BS right now and you know how you're sinking your own ship, like start now. Don't wait. So just plan like tonight, either take the night off and don't eat. You'll probably feel amazing tomorrow morning. Just for most people, just like take the night off, go for a walk instead, or just have an earlier, later dinner. Just eat a little earlier, eat a little lighter, only drink water after dinner, brush your teeth and floss after dinner. So you're not tempted to put something else into your pie hole before you go to bed. Call it good. And tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to actually naturally do more of those habits anyways, because you're just going to be more in sync with nature's rhythms. If you're like, oh, I'll start tomorrow. And then later tonight, you're, someone's like, hey, let's go grab some Thai food. And you go and you get all your favorite things. And it's heavy and it's oily. And you leave and you feel bloated and heavy. Like, you already ruined tomorrow. You really did. Like, you already shot tomorrow in the foot. <laughs> I, I think it's a really interesting concept that I've never heard of. Because it is always usually like, oh, we'll start like start tomorrow and this tomorrow's a new day and there's all this stuff about morning habits which I do think are great but it's it's like um it's like right now is a great time to start quit saying you're gonna do it tomorrow I love right that. I mean I live in Mexico half time and the Mexicans totally have it down there they're like manana and <laughs> manana can be like whenever they're like tomorrow <laughs> Yeah, I used to live in South America, and they had a, an expression to, like that, too. What was it? I can't remember what it is now. Oh, they say just now. Oh, yeah, I'll get that to you just now. And that could mean any length of time. <laughs> 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 just now is any length of time. And, and they thought it was hilarious if we were like, I'll be there in an hour. They're like, no, oh, that's really funny. Why would you give such an exact amount of time? But, I mean, it's a cultural thing. It's it's all good, but it's true. It's so easy to say we're going to start making change eventually where really we can just right now make a change in our dinner. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've got dinner, and we're eating earlier and later. We're avoiding snacking after dinner. Hopefully we are waking up feeling more refreshed because of that. So I think you said it's just it's a lot to – it's just heavier for our bodies – to digest if we eat late and eat heavy stuff? Is that basically the concept? Well, I mean, the concept in Ayurveda is, is just based on observing nature. So human beings are, we're primates, right? So we're monkeys and we're not canines and we're not felines and we're not a quad, you know, it's like we're, there's a lot that we're not, but we are primates. So what it, how, how do primates' bodies digest? So if we just look at that, like those basic rhythms of primate digestion, we know it's we're diurnal. We digest better in day, not night, in daytime. Our eyes need sunlight to see what we want to put in the pie hole, to see if it's safe, <laughs> right? We're not like, – like your sense of smell compared to your cats or dogs, like forget about it. You don't even – you're not even showing up on the map. Like you cannot smell out your, your like in a live animal that you want to eat, right? You can't like smell it out. I mean, we could maybe a little bit better a couple, th you know, thousand, tens of thousand years ago, but not even then, not so much. Like the puma would get the small critter over us. Um, if it was at night, if it's during the day that we're hunting, our eyes are amazing. And so we'd have our spears, we'd climb the trees, we'd see really, really far away. And we'd be able to like hunt those same animals uh, with much better luck than the pumas, right? So we get this, like our, our digestion is old, our bodies are old. You're borrowing an old physiology for this runaround of this lifetime, right? And so when you get that, you're diurnal, you're not nocturnal. The invention of electricity changed our eating habits as a species. It's not a problem. Right, but just know if you're gonna eat your biggest meal at night, like you're gonna feel like lard when you wake up in the morning. 
And you don't want that for yourself. Like you want to live a vibrant, awake life. You don't want to have chronic health issues, chronic inflammation issues, chronic immune issues, chronic autoimmune issues. And you will if you don't live in touch with being a primate, that you're a monkey. Monkeys eat when the sun is highest in the sky. That's when we have the most bile. We do not eat mm. after the sun has gone down. Why? Because we don't have bile to digest it. Mm. So then what's going to happen? We're going to end up with partially digested gook in our digestive tract. That, if we keep that up as a habit, it's going to seep into our blood. The gook goes into the blood. The gook in Ayurveda is called ama. It goes into our blood, and then it finds the weakest tissue in our bodies. If we keep up the habit, it keeps looking. Like, where do we dump the gook? Where's we put the waste? And it's like, oh, let's, that joint's weak, or that bodily tissue's weak, or that genetic pattern's there, so we'll just influence that. It just The gook starts to go in the weaker systems and tissues of the body, and it starts to create the disease pattern. That's one of the ways that disease is created. And, it's, and right now, in this day and age, the modern, hyper-modern era, it's definitely prevalent, and we see it. You see people walking around with poor quality bodily tissue. Mm. You know, and you compare that to what a Native American looked like 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 300 years ago, and you're like, the degree of poor quality is insane. <laughs> like, we're so, I we're know. so bloated. <laughs> Sometimes in the healthcare world, you get a little bit insulated, but I've been traveling this summer and, you know, I'm in campgrounds and the Hoover Dam, and you just look around and it's like, yeah, you, know, you just, yeah, people look so much older than they should. You know, they look so pale and bloated, and it's just, I don't know, it's just kind of sad to me. It's like, gosh, we could all be doing so much better. And it, yeah. uh, so it's, I'm appreciative of the work you're doing. It sounds like a lot of people are finding this work and, and learning and hopefully spreading the word. It's just so important. Yeah, and it's free. I mean, it's cheaper. It's free. It's like there's no reason not to. I'm not saying like eat your kale, right? It's like, no, just like just whatever you're eating, just do it earlier and make it lighter. Like just So if that means you want to eat the exact same thing, just eat a lot less of it. If it means that you want to eat a large quantity, then eat things that are much lighter, like leafy greens or, or uh, broth-based soups, right? Because you can eat a large quantity of that and – It'll just hydrate you or nutrify you, and, and it won't really create a lot of digestive issues if it's, yeah, if it's seasonal. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to plug in my computer so don't be weirded out if I disappear for a minute. Um, let's talk about the morning time. Yeah. Yeah. So now, like, if you ate early and lighter and you went to bed before 10 – uh, which usually helps like that's sort of the witching hour because if you go to bed earlier uh, than 10 you get a deeper quality of sleep than if you go to bed after you get like that second wind then you're kind of basically using tomorrow's energy today so you go to bed a little earlier you wake up after eight hours and you're in a much lighter vibrant state already and there's a natural desire to hydrate and eliminate so usually the first impulse of our horizon is urination so you urinate you get the old out then you hydrate hydration and for me it's, it's usually quite a bit it might be like a quart sometimes even I've been known to be dehydrated and drink up to two quarts of water in the morning that's a little excessive for most people but I am me and that's me and what that does is stimulate a complete bowel movement so then I a complete bowel movement a lot of people don't know but it's it's like 18 inches of fecal matter it's not like a little few turds. It's 18 inches of fecal matter. Moves out of the normal human primate digestive tract in the morning. And when that happens, you feel a rush of energy. You're like, I am the queen. I mean, you just feel on top of the world. If you're hydrated and you've had a complete bowel movement on top of a full night's sleep, on top of an earlier, later dinner, you start to feel like a goddess. And so, you know, you know that, that being that, you then actually naturally have the impulse to see what your superpowers are and move your body. And that's the breath body practices. So it's pretty much that simple, like wake up, urinate, hydrate, eliminate, like open your mind to a bigger perspective. Now there's, from an Ayurvedic perspective, there's actually prana or life force energy scintillating in your colon. It's a really cool feeling. It only usually happens at that time of day, or it's better when it happens that time of day because your awareness is more subtle to perceive it. And you're now in alignment. The morning, if we look at like any tradition around the world, like the nuns 
their chanting practices in the morning, the Zen priests, their practices early in the morning. If you look at like what time does the Dalai Lama go to bed? I think it's 8.30. What time does he wake up? Somewhere between like 3.30 right? And and why? Because he's going to milk it from like 3.30 to 6.30. <laughs> he's like, that's gold. And that's when I, I'm not going to sleep through that. It doesn't get better than that, right? And so we've known this, doesn't matter what tradition you come from, we've known that access to the spiritual and subtle realms happens early in the morning. And it happens much better if you're well-rested, if you're hydrated, and if there's no poop in your channels, <laughs> if you will, right? So we do that. And then we have the desire to, to breathe and to move. And it doesn't have to be like a two-hour spin class. It can just be 20 minutes of just breathing and moving. Some some people, even in like healing processes, if you've injured something or if you're something's broken and you can't breathe and move right now, you can still breathe. And the yogis call that pranayama, and they do that first thing in the morning where they just sit or lie or put their body in a specific position and then mindfully move breath for about 15 minutes. So that can work too. My What I tend to do is put on loud rap music and my wireless earbuds and pick up different free weights and do some sort of combination of dance uh, and I don't know what it is, tactical body weight movement, functional movement, uh, and yeah, all sorts of things. Yoga, I'll put some yoga in there. And I just like, I have a very strong body and I work my body out for 20 minutes, usually at least uh, with, with weights because I'm strong and it feels so good. But earlier, you know, five years ago, when I practiced was probably pranayama and yoga. So it can change. It can be very variable. It doesn't, I find it doesn't matter. It's like whatever lights you up, whatever makes you want to engage more life force energy in the physical tissue of your body, do that. Hmm. Yeah, I like that there's options there, too. And because some people, like, aren't interested in yoga or don't have a gym membership or whatever. And it's like, well, just... Do whatever you want. Watch a YouTube video and work out to it or do whatever, like, yeah, walk with a friend. Like, it's it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Follow your desire. I mean, I think Joseph Campbell said a blast with uh, follow your bliss. Um, I think L Vish Vishen Lakiani, who wrote The Code of the Extraordinary Mind, he said it really well. Too. He calls it a bliscipline. Like, know what your blisciplines are. They're the disciplines that bring you bliss. Mm, right? Yeah. And it's, I think as we start to pay attention to this as a species, like, oh, our desire isn't a bad thing. It's actually a really, really good thing. And it points us right in the right direction. Intuition speaks through desire. Okay. Right? Like, I like this more. Great. Do that. It's good. That's where the energy is for you. Yeah. And I think we can get mixed up. We'll say, well, you know, I really desire ice cream and to stay, <laughs> stay up till midnight. <laughs> though, right? There's those desires. But those can be escapes or addictions. Well, it's not linked, it's not linked to a discipline. So, oh, okay. That, see, gotcha. that's why it's a blissipline. It's a desire that's linked to a discipline. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, because following the desire, that, that interpretation got <laughs> a little bit a little bit gray. You bend that one. I really <laughs> want two liters of Diet Coke right now. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, let's see. I have your other 10 written down here somewhere. Oh, so I can keep just going. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, so... We got our, well, maybe this is a great place to say now our day is starting. Maybe we're, our family's waking up, we're going to work. So now we're, we are sort of getting into some of the stuff around relationships, perhaps. Yeah, so the way that I see it is I have the 10 habits and then relationships are like, a, it's like something you're going to have to work on within the 10 habits, you know, so I don't consider it a habit itself, although you easily could have habits in relationship of like, then my habit is to do this. Um, and there's a really good book called The Power of Habit where uh, Charles Duhigg lays out like the idea of like when you're trying to establish any habit, you have a trigger, a habit, and reward. And I try to bring in a lot of habit, what I call habit evolution science, normally called behavioral science, uh, into the Body Thrive book to help people with a few of these tools without having to read everything that I had to read to figure it out. Uh, but that whole idea of like you can trigger any habits. So say, uh, for instance, me with my daughter this morning. This morning was gymnastics day. She's on pre-team. She's very close to making team. She needs to do full splits. So now that I know that, that was new information today, we're going to be working on full splits every morning for probably two minutes, not longer. Just two minutes. I'll show her what I know from yoga. I, I, I come from horribly inflexible people. Uh, luckily, I married my husband who comes from more, <laughs> more, there's a little more flexibility on that side. So the girl has a, she's got a shot. 
I'll just put it. She's, got, she's definitely has a fair shot of this one. So I'm going to show her what I know then, and we'll turn that into a habit. One of the best things about habits is they stack easily, like very, very small habits, like two-minute habits stack really easily. So she and I already have a habit of wake up, she urinates, she scrapes her tongue, she drinks water. So then after she's done that, we could put that habit, this new habit starting tomorrow of like two minutes of, uh, of basically doing Hanumanasana in various variations to like open some stuff in her body. And then we get on to the next thing in her day. So that's an example of like whenever you're trying to learn something new, like stack a very small piece of that. Like don't try to bite the whole elephant off in one chunk, right? But just take a little tiny bite and automate the regularity of it. So it's stacked onto something else and it's a very small bite-sized thing to do. Yeah. So you, what you'll see there too is like, oh, I'm, I'm training my kid to like wake up, hydrate, eliminate, you know, scrape tongue. I'm training my kid to move in the morning. Like, okay, let's do our little, we'll do some, we'll do some split stuff then. We'll do some handstands and splits then. Uh, and then that's training her body to like, okay, we move in the morning. A lot of kids don't. Like a lot of families, like you wake up and there's like a TV on with the all important news. And the take everyone's taking this in, and it's and it almost doesn't even seem by choice. It's like responsibility as a citizen to know the news of the day, without realizing that like oh my gosh, like everything that's being said is being absorbed, and then I have to digest it and process it, and it really might not be what I want to hear early in the morning, and it might actually distract me from feeling my body. It might bring me more into my head, um, and even more into my um, my heart with like concern for what's going on with the world, but not to my physical body. My physical body wants to just like do jumping jacks right now or doesn't want to do jumping jacks, but it should want to do jumping jacks because I want to exercise more in my life. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so then after we've moved, then it goes into like, what are you going to put? Like, how are you going to fuel yourself? So plant-based diet is next and plant-based diet. I mean, to me, it's just connecting us with our ecosystem. It's pretty simple. You know, a couple hundred years ago, indigenous people knew a few hundred species that they could eat in their ecosystem. And now we don't know like literally any, <laughs> you know, like no. most kids can't go outside and identify an edible weed. No. Right. They just don't I, know. I, I mean, can't do it either. <laughs> well, but I mean, inner city kids can't go into, we know this now statistically inner, like inner city kids can't go into a Seven Eleven and I, and like really identify over 10 fruits or vegetables or like any grocery store. But like there's kids that are at like five years old, like really confusing tomatoes with apples because they're not – and that if we're doing it for a normal five-year-old is like not a problem, right? They know an apple from a tomato. Like all they have in common is there's some redness in the color. And after that, they don't taste alike, right? Their tastes are different. Their texture is different. Their flavors are different. Like there's there's nothing else that's the same. But we're so confused as a as a species now. So the plant based diet is just reconnecting with plants. Like go in the grocery store, and see what jumps onto your cart. Like who are you wanting to commune with? Like what's going? On? Like whoa, those sprouts look good, or that, like wow, that celery looks really fresh today. Or you know, just like starting to notice what your physiology notices. I mean, so many people go through the grocery store and they're like, I should eat kale, you know? Mm. And the kale might look like wilted and. You know, it just might you know, might not even know what to do with it, and the lettuce next to it is like super vibrant. But some part of you might be like, I have to do, I should eat this instead. So it's just really waking up to to plants, and then on a more sophisticated level, it's starting to actually really develop relationship with plants and different species, and seasonal eating, and ecosystems, and becoming someone that's not just a consumer, but someone who's a collaborator on this planet, and collaborating with the plants, and collaborating with the uh, higher consciousness that's really available. I think the living foods people are the most tuned into this. And uh, in the foodie world, the people doing with raw foods, living foods, they're they're really uh, some of the most aware people in terms of plant energetics and plant communication and dynamics, you know, in terms of the in, in the world of just different diets. Mm -hmm. I've really found that. Ayurveda is too, to some degree. I think it used to be much more so than the way it's currently taught, which is just like, personalized medicine like you're this type and these are the foods you should eat which is very reductionist yeah I'm so, get tired of that after a while yeah so it's just really about connecting and and adding different species to your diet okay. there's another habit that comes later in the book called healthier eating guidelines that really deals with with one of the bigger issues 
Uh, so many people are like, what, you know, it's like, what should I eat? And I'm just like, you should, you should rekindle your relationship with plants, <laughs> you know, like find out which plants are talking to you. And that's like the first thing. But one of the next things that come pretty rapidly in the course is, is healthier eating guidelines. And the biggest thing I find with healthier eating guidelines and Ayurveda has a list of them. I'm sure Chinese medicine does too. It's like, there's a list of some very simple guidelines to optimize your digestion, absorption, and elimination, which is more or less like besides pleasure, the name of the game with, with food. And it's the more fundamental uh, box to check off your list, right? Than like, it was a pleasurable experience. It's like, no, like digestion, absorption, elimination. Is it optimizing your physiology? Because if that's good, you're going to be psyched. And if that's not good, you are not going to be psyched. So in healthier eating guidelines, the idea of not snacking, I mean, this is revolutionary in 2016 to like not eat constantly throughout the day that like eating is not a pleasure sport. Like it's, you know, it's, um, it's very hard in my, and when we notice this in the courses that work with the 10 weeks in the book, some people will like, start doing it immediately. And they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know how much snacking was um, depleting my energy, my immune system, my emotional stability, right? So I was more anxious. I didn't realize I was anxious. I had low grade anxiety. I had no idea I had low grade anxiety. So I stopped snacking. Uh, wow, it was really affecting my sleep. Wow, it was really affecting the quality of my bodily tissue. So we get these people that they, they start doing it right away and they make these massive changes and they're like, oh my gosh. And that's where the weight falls off. Usually if there's excess weight, the weight will fall off. If there's no excess weight, the emotions stabilize on a whole new level of spiritual capacity. Their sight. Because ideal people will let, like want that, <laughs> right? So then the people that don't do it, they're like, oh my gosh, I wish I had that habit. And they start to have habit envy. Like, oh, I wish I was not a snacker. Like, this is so hard. And they're working with, they're working with Kaizen. They're working with a lot of the emotional issues that are connected to, like, putting something in your pie hole whenever your emotions go up or down or around, right? And there's, they're starting to want to, like, just basically get control um, of that and start to really experience a deeper level of, of nourishment by taking the time to sit and really nourish their body and really nourish their emotions, so they're learning that, and it's and that's sometimes a longer curve that might take someone much longer than ten weeks. And I understand because that one took me a while. Gum helped me a lot, like brushing my teeth, flossing, and then chewing gum between meals helped me to like not put something else in that would go into my stomach. I'm not advocating gum chewing, but it was a very good crutch for me for a while until that habit was, you know, no longer an issue. Yeah. So then there's some other just simple habits like. Sitting in silence. I mean, this is such a big one, right? Where we really look at mind, body, spirit balance. If there's not a time of day where we're just sitting consciously or lying down, if we don't have the energy to sit because we're exhausted, then like lying down consciously and just being aware of awareness, just being aware of being a human being, just literally awareing. Like I'm just awareing, not really thinking, not fixing any problems in my mind. Not really getting involved. I'm just gonna sit and be a human being. That that all of a sudden has like these massive effects in terms of slowing the aging process, in terms of maximizing clarity and focus, in terms of increasing empathy and interconnectivity, which very much makes our relationships a heck of a lot more fun, right? And then there's some other habits too with um, just how we take care of our senses. The next two are like that with um, self-massage, like using your own hands to just totally wake up your body, to massage your body. I dry – the way I was taught self-massage in Ayurveda was really more oil-centric where you rub oil on your skin. Oil is amazing. It protects the skin ecosystem. It nourishes the skin ecosystem. It gives us a sense of self. It increases circulation increases detoxification like it's good 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 but I often find now just like if I don't have time for the oil like first thing in the morning after I like hydrate or urinate hydrate eliminate I like take my hands on my naked body and I give myself like a two minute rub down and it's just like a check-in it's like are the parts all here do we know do <laughs> right did I like did I lose anything overnight like are all the right and it wakes you up to your own body you're now literally in touch with yourself. Mm. Yeah, that was one that I, I was surprised to see on the list. Like if I had to would have had to guess ahead of time what will be on the list. I wouldn't have thought, oh self-massage will be on here. It's interesting. It's an interesting one. 
Yeah, not, a lot of that came from just, uh, I mean, it is a daily practice in Ayurvedic uh, uh, lifestyle. So it's, it's very much in there. It's, I'm not, I'm, you guys, I'm not making anything up here. I'm just basically like reporting from the hood. Uh, and <laughs> and in that, we got the like, Ayurvedic hood. We got I was the just hood. down in the Ayurvedic hood, and this is, <laughs> this is what was going on down there. <laughs> this is how it goes down in the Ayurvedic hood. You get an oil, you get a vat of oil, and you dip yourself in it. I mean, basically, it's true. Uh, but <laughs> the thing... The thing of the matter is like you become in touch with yourself. And what I found after, you know, 10 years as an Ayurvedic practitioner, so that would have brought me to 2011. In 2008, I started teaching the Living Ayurveda course. It's a nine-month uh, dynamic group online uh, experience. And it's what well, we found, I mean, just a year after a year. I've been teaching since 2008. So we're going into our, no, 2007. So we're about to embark on our 10th year, reformatting the entire course with like what's present, what's working. Self-massage, seeing how that impacted people's lives like year after year after year and like group after group after group. It was just like, it's definitely a habit and it has to be isolated from the other sense organ care habits. It is a sense organ care habit in Ayurveda. Your skin is, you know, it's like, it's the physical barrier between you and the rest of the world. It's also a sense organ. It's how you feel. It's how you touch. Right. But basically, when I pulled it out as a habit, the reason I did so is because of seeing the impact that that habit had on so many people. So many, I mean, I don't know what the numbers are. They're insane, though. It's like one in three or one in four people has gone through either physical or emotional abuse. It's so high. So we're not whole. Right. And our hands have us, they have a capacity to heal. And they bring us in touch with the parts that are not whole. And, and, and the idea, too, in Ayurveda is that the reason we use oil, another reason is it's fat. And fat is a lubricant. Fat also has the – it's the physical equivalent of the emotion love. So in Sanskrit, words have different resonant capacities. So if you're saying snehana, which is the word for this oiliness, it's, it has a meaning that's rooted in love. So when you rub love on your physical body with oil, you love on yourself, right? You become more loved. You become more loving. You become more lovable, right? So like just basically like your love quotient starts to skyrocket. Anyone that's uh, like I am not enough starts to feel like I am enough on a very physical level. They start to get really in touch with the body. Anyone carrying extra fat in the, you know, just like basically waste is fat, and their body starts to not need that insulation because they're actually, they're they're like rubbing it away. They're like they're like the rubbing the genie out of the bottle is really what it feels like. You're just like rubbing the genie out of the bottle, and all of a sudden, like you start to shine from the inside out because that fat becomes incorporated in the other qualities of the tissue of the body, and you start to shine. In Ayurveda, like one of the ways you know someone is healthy is they shine. <laughs> You can see the light shining from their eyes. You can see the glow shining from their skin, right? And yeah. so, and you can see it in a guru, right? You can see that there's like light coming out of like a true guru, a true vaidya. There's literally light pouring out of them, and it and it has a shine. So a shine and light's different. Like light is light, but a shine is like the oiliness. It's the rubbing the genie out of the bottle quality of full integration or full bodily integrity. So that's why I pulled that one out. I love it. I'm gonna, I want to just go run, rub some oil. <laughs> go rub, go it, some sounds, down. <laughs> it sounds amazing. I love fat as a physical equivalent of love. That's so amazing. And you see, too, I mean, I'll try not to go too far on a tangent, but, you know, people are still kind of in that, oh, if I eat a low-fat diet, I'll, I'll be skinny. And oh, my God. It's just, that's I just I can't when you say fat and love I just feel like oh god that diet is so like the equivalent of like just starving yourself of nourishment and love it's like those people are always kind of starving yeah yeah <laughs> okay have are there any habits we've missed or yeah or the tenth one have? so okay Let's yeah see. drum roll please um. What happened is actually the first time I taught the habits, in, and I, this was an experiment with uh, people would go through living living Ayurveda course, and they're like, I want to help my everyone. I want to help my kids. I want to help my partner. I want to help my friends. Everyone's asking me for help, you know, or their yoga teachers. Like, my students are asking me more about 
or your beta like I they want they see me and I'm doing way better and they notice that I'm not the same and it's better and they want what I have right and so that's where all of this came from is me saying like okay I'll create I'm really good at creating curriculums based on um, demand right so like this is what we want I'm like okay great we're gonna do, we'll I'll figure it out <laughs> with you guys and so I came up with those nine habits and then and then we went through the cycle once and I'm like oh something's missing and it's easeful living it's that that we have a choice in our relationship to life and and there's good statistics on this now from you know from like NIH that just show that like we have a choice in our perception and when we choose ease over stress uh, again like all the anti-aging factors skyrocket in our benefit right all the all of the other ways that we measure thrive, whether it's um, spiritual or relational or uh, emotional or physical, like they skyrocket with a perspective of ease. When we have this perspective of stress, it's the opposite, like cholesterol rises, inflammation rises, blood pressure rises, heartbeat rises, like you're aging faster now. It's like what you, to what you said earlier, Bridget, like how like people that are unhealthy look way older than they should look like why because you've accelerated aging why because of your perspective so if you have a perspective that like my life is stressful I my life is overwhelming life is overwhelming I don't have enough time I don't like the spaces that I'm in so I keep buying stuff right? <laughs> or whatever right or um, I, I'm a victim in this relationship there's nothing I can do Right. All of that is going to age you more rapidly. So once we know that, we can actually build a habit around the perspective that we want to be running the operating system of us. Right. And so I try to choose ease. And when I notice myself not choosing ease, it's like, hello, Stillman. Uh, let's make a conscious choice here. Do we need a little time out? Do we need to sit down for a minute or lay down and breathe. Do we need to just take a nap. Do we need some, uh, like, what is not working? And often it's just a check-in of, like, oh, I have a choice right now. I don't have to stress. I don't have to react to the situation. I can breathe. I can open. I can expand. And then I can tap into what needs to happen next from a place of empowerment. So that is the habit of easeful living. Uh, some people say that's their keystone habit. I heard that when I was teaching my course last week and we were talking about easeful living and someone said this is my keystone habit, meaning that this is the habit that makes all the other habits that she wants fall into place. They like click in, click, 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 right? And then it, it all works together. For me, my, my keystone habit is breath body practices. You take that away, I am a lump. You give me that, like, no problem. We got it covered. Right, and so for I her, that was how, Oh, yeah, go, sorry. I, didn't, I just could oh, see, if, like, for every different sort of personality type, like, I know you said you're very physical and you always have been, so for you to take that piece away falls apart, and everybody's probably a little different on what, what piece they need the most. For a lot of people, it's uh, meditation or sitting in silence. I mean, for a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people. Like, you take that away, nothing else works. Uh, what I like is that you, I hope we start to see that it's like you can start with where your desire is too. like you don't have to go through the habits in order if you're like there's one of them and you start to do that and you have an awareness that these other habits might be good for you based on 5,000 years of evidence right and you just have an idea of like there's some evidence there I'm just gonna notice like I'm gonna choose meditation because that's my keystone habit already so and I'm just gonna notice Oh, I notice that when I eat later at night, I wake up and I feel heavy. So let me just see then if I eat a little earlier, do I wake up and feel better? You can start to notice the other habits from the perspective of your keystone habit without having to like get all gung-ho about them. You can be kind of casual about them. And they'll generally unfold into what you're already doing. I think that mm. effortless approach is also part of the easeful living perspective of just being like, how easy is this going to be? This doesn't have to be this big deal. Like this could, I could actually just naturally flow into these habits sort of effortlessly just through 1% improvement a day and see what happens. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So even just the idea of um, adopting these habits can be useful as well. 
Yeah, and even just one percent improvement on any of these habits consistently, or one percent improvement on random habits day after day of of these ten habits in a random order, like just having that perspective of like, you know, I tell my students now often like, if you see it like this, like back to the snacking, right? The people that are having trouble snacking, I'm like, look at it this way: your snacking days, you keep up these other habits, your snacking days are they're numbered. So don't stress out about them, like celebrate them. Because they're not, they're not going to last. They can't last around the other habits. And if that's your perspective, they'll probably just start to fall away. Interesting. And you'll habits start to notice. They're coming. Yeah, I mean, you, and people start to notice that meals taste so much better if you haven't had snacks in between. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that one is, I'm sure, a hard one for, for people to snack in and eating early. And uh, I, I would say, like, I was reading through your books today, and it just definitely felt more... Um, more doable when you talked about how other people kind of work through it or how you're explaining now. It doesn't have to be like, I'm going to make myself go to bed and not snack. <laughs> but <laughs> it can be Get out gradual. that hair shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it can be loving. Um, so I wanted to make a couple announcements. Um, <laughs> we're going to take questions in a minute if you still have time, Kate. We still have time. Yeah, I, you know, I'll go pee and get the. And if there's any questions, right when I come back, does that sound good? Great. I'm gonna make in a couple. Yeah, I'm gonna make a couple announcements while you're done. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so if you are live on the call, you can make a um a question right on the chat. You can just do it in the chat, or there's a little way to raise your hand and and give a, a question. So um, whichever way you want to do it, um, there's there's no bad question. So. We really would like to hear from you, or if there's like an aha you got from Kate's information, go ahead and type it in the chat. And meanwhile, I'm going to show a couple things. Two things. So first is, this is Kate's book, and the website that you'll go to if you click this will have it more information too. Um, she mentioned that there are book clubs. So this is one way to interact with this Body Thrive information, which I think is just really exciting stuff. So that's one. I'm going to leave this up for one more minute, and then I will um, post the other. So these should open like in a new tab. Uh, and if you watch the recording of this, you'll have it again later. Okay, next one. Hey, can you see the chat or no? It says this feature is disabled on mine. When I click on Q and A, we can also do it via Facebook. Would that be easier just to send people the? Well, I can see the chat to at help to tell you, oh. but um, I just wanted to share. I'm putting in the little chat now your your book, and now I'm putting up the the program, the group program. Okay. Um, so yeah, people can click on it. Um, Maybe you can explain a little bit more about the group program. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. So, yeah, you guys can, if you want, there's all the details, too, on bodythrive.com. Uh, and then just go to, to group. Our next group is starting in September. Uh, and it's, it's it basically, there's a, you know, if you go to, if you go to Body Thrive and you'll, you'll fill out an application and then you'll have a conversation with, uh, with someone in our admissions department. We just like really to make sure that people, like I said, we do dynamic groups. So we kind of make sure people are ready to be in a dynamic group because that readiness, like if there's a whole bunch of people that are like really ready to make changes, what happens in that group is just tremendous. And so that's why we have an application process and then it's not just like, yeah, click and sign up. It's like, no, you got to talk to somebody. We got to make sure that like you're ready because if you're ready for some awesome changes in your life, then you're going to be a really good fit for the group. If you're kind of like, I'm not sure I'm ready, we'll help you determine whether you're ready or not. Uh, and so it's a great idea. Like, get, you know, if you want to be in the group, just go and uh, go and apply. And we have an awesome admissions team. They're amazing. They're actually on the pot. Grace Edison is one of them. She was on the podcast last week. Alex is going to be on the podcast soon. So Grace or Alex is who you'll talk to. And they're incredibly humane people who've been through a lot in their lives, which is why they're on my admissions teams, because they can really relate to people that have a lot going on um, and have some things that maybe aren't really going very well either. Uh, they're incredibly approachable people. And 
we always do this with any of the courses we have a conversation just to make sure that it's an awesome fit both ways because what that does is actually it's part of our onboarding process it like helps you get really really clear on what you will want out of this 10-week experience and the more clarity you have around that the more reality um, the more that will become reality but if it's not that clear we'll help you get really clear in that session as well so that's the best place to go is just go to bodyfrag.com and then click on the groups thing at the top and and uh, and apply and and then they'll take it from there. And what's actually nice about starting in September is you can kind of read the book over the summer and and just kind of dabble on your own and get your stoke on and then take off like rocket fuel in September. Thanks cool, for asking. Cool. Really sweet. Okay. So yeah, and I've shared the book. So let's take some questions. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just reading here. Mm, let's see. I'm not want to unpack this question. How to best identify what's working or not working? I'm wanting to try more than one change at a time, which is potentially problematic, but quicker. So you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, with those habits, like early to so we've got earlier, later dinners, early to bed, start their day right, which is you know urinate, hydrate, poop, uh, which is a training. Some people can't hit that right off the bat. Uh, exercise before you eat in the morning, essentially like breath body practices. Uh, eating more plants in your diet, uh, not snacking or eating meals spaced out, only drinking water in between meals, self-massage, sense organ care, which we didn't really get into, but how do you take care of your other senses, your eyes, your ears, your your nose, your tongue, uh, sitting in meditation, useful living, like what, what, where, like if you want to do a bunch of ones, how do you notice? Like I wouldn't worry about it. I would just do, I would honestly do as many as you can easily and see what starts to happen because it, like they do click in for each other. So I wouldn't worry about as much like, you know, needing to measure the differences of what happens when you focus on one versus the other. Because the more you do one, if you understand the concept that all of these habits are just these these little like anchors that anchor us into living in sync with our own rhythm as a primate on planet Earth in this cosmos, and that this cosmos and this planet and this physiology has certain rules, it has certain rhythms, and when we honor those rhythms, we thrive. When we do not honor those rhythms, we suffer, right? So that's kind of, I wouldn't worry about too much about no, like how you're going to notice it working because you're just going to feel better and better and better on, on all levels of life. Hmm. Okay, so you never had anybody who was like, oh, I tried that thing. It totally didn't work for me. <laughs> Does, that doesn't really happen. No, no and it's crazy <laughs> because like my, we have people in, all the yoga health coaches have to go through have to go through body thrive they have to go through as a student as a participating student not as a know-it-all teacher we have teachers that have been teaching yoga for 30 years in like the major united states cities like very good yoga teachers have massive health breakthroughs of these 10 habits like people who we already they already kind of like i kind of got that dial and they go through and they're like i didn't not at this level mm -hmm. so that yeah. happens and then we have like people that are super skeptical you know, who just like pick up a copy of the book and they try earlier, later dinner, and they're like, "Whoa, <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know what my heavier later dinner was costing me," and now I do, and now I realize I don't want to drink alcohol at night either. Most of the time, yeah, maybe sometimes here and there, it's not a big deal. I don't have to have a rule about it, but it doesn't. It, I feel even better when I don't do that too. But they kind of went with a heavier later dinner, so I was kind of doing that anyways. But now that I eat earlier. I actually want to do stuff after dinner. I want to go play or go for a bike ride or garden. And, and I don't want to have the heaviness of alcohol in me because I'm more awake for these hours of the evening. I'm more connected. You know, so we see things like that where like a good habit triggers another good habit triggers another good habit. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking now that maybe uh, this person just put their name as Jay. I'm thinking maybe the thing you this is what some of my clients do. Oh, I don't want to try a few things to see what's working, what did what. You know, that's. And to me, I'm like, this isn't a science experiment. It's just, just do whatever feels better. But I guess, you know, Jay, if you're curious what does what, you could do one thing at a time. 
But it sounds like Kate's also saying it's okay to just try a few things at once if you're excited about it because they're all kind of part of the natural rhythm of the day, an ideal rhythm of the day. Um, I mean, so. almost for everybody that starts eating an earlier, later dinner, they almost all naturally start to go to bed earlier. Like eating oh, later keeps people up later. Okay. But if there's no dessert, if there's no like ice cream in front of the TV at 10 o'clock, you're probably not going to be as interested in staying awake. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So Jahan had a question about fertility. She has her book and she got some, some something about mama birthing. Are you? Oh yeah, I have a mom, mama. Yeah, it's my site. Oh. Yeah. Oh okay. <laughs> Another little thing. Okay, I didn't even know that was you. Um, she just wondered about recommendations for fertility, um, perhaps within this framework or anything else, and that's definitely my background. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Johan, if you want to have a more specific question too, throw it up there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say just – you know, get like being on board with your partner around the habits. So even if the partner doesn't want to do the habits, that they support you in in the habits. It's very very important. But the more you both do it, the better, because the more you'll you'll both get more in sync. I would say probably one of the most important habits with with pregnancy is uh, is actually easeful living. That's really where I go first because the you're giving the next generation a shot at ease. Like the emotions in which you conceive and carry are the emotions that um, you're bathing your baby in for the next nine months. So even having the perspective of like, oh my gosh, getting pregnant is going to be like the easiest thing ever. I'm, I'm supported by the universe, even just by having the desire to have a baby. And, and you start to just get really connected around that. And you start to notice when fear comes up or contraction comes up around needing to do this a certain way or needing to have a certain body in order to do this or needing to, uh, do this for anybody else or however anyone else wants it done and you start to really just take charge of like Wow, just the desire To have a baby means like I'm in the realm of the baby spirits and this is gonna be fun And like who's coming in and like can I can you help me with these habits because these habits are gonna be awesome for us like that's That's how I would approach it. I love it. I love it. I love the mindset piece. So Jahan asked one follow-up question which is she used to do shank pro shank pro -shalana? I don't know what that is. Is that some kind of pose or something? She says can she do it now while she's trying to conceive? Uh, ask your body. Mm. As if this is helping or not. If it's coming more from your mind then let it go. Like really pregnancy is not about it's not a third it's not a third eye chakra. It's not a sixth chakra. It's a second chakra experience. So dropping more and more awareness into your pelvis uh, throughout every little decision of the day will support your pregnancy. Like start to live from your pelvis. Our our culture, especially our um, like educated woman culture, is very six chakra oriented. We're way more cerebral. So we have trouble getting pregnant or we stress out about pregnancy or we stress out about birth or we stress out about being able to nourish our baby with our body. Right, and it's it's like these are cultural issues for the most part. So if we just shift into like, I'm gonna live for my pelvis for the next couple years, you know, and just start to make decisions from like, what does my body want to do? Does my body want to do whatever to Shankabala or whatever? I don't even know what it was. Um, like, does my body want to do some sort of pranayama? My guess is it's some sort of breathing exercise. Um, in general, I wouldn't. I would. I would just notice your body breathing deeply, and let, let the, the basic rule of thumb is this is a pranayama practice that we're talking about, or a breathing practice. Let the prana lead the way. So, if the pranic body, if your energy body, if you're in your pelvis and you're in your mindset, you're in that easeful living of like this is going to be the easiest, most fun thing ever, getting pregnant and being pregnant, having a a baby come out of me and take care of this baby going to be amazing and then let the breath just start to pulsate and open your body and if it does that practice fine and if it does not do that practice uh, finer because now you're probably more in the realm of creativity and baby energy is a very very creative energy it's like what are we making yeah yeah it's our true. love yeah, that's the real struggle for modern women is they think they want to troubleshoot it and it's they want to schedule it. 
Yeah. They're like, tell me exactly what to do. And what to, and it's, it's so hard because it, 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 but it pushes this. Evolution. I want to have my baby in May. So I'm gonna, <laughs> you know what? A surprising number of people could do it. Like teachers are always like, I want to have a baby in May or June. So I'm going to have a surprising number of people will get that done. You would not believe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, I mean, it really speaks no. to the power of the positive mindset. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you really can get it done like that. Um, it's really funny. She said it's a full yoga clean, cleansing detox is what she said it was. So, oh, okay. yeah. I said, so if you're not pregnant, then yeah, go for it. Go yeah. For it. You know, if you're, I don't know how strong it is. Or if you're not depleted, is, but, right? If you're not, if you're not depleted, if you're toxic, detox before you get pregnant. Absolutely. Get the toxins out of your body. And then start rebuilding before you try. But don't try when you're detoxifying. Don't even really try until you're on the secondary phase of the rebuilding. That's in terms of like Panchakarma 101 for fertility. That's Panchakarma 101 for fertility. Detox, both people, rejuvenate, then get pregnant immediately after rejuvenation. Because you'll be high and you'll be in the field of unity. Mm, yeah, that's good advice. Since people are like, well, I want to detox, but I don't want to wait to try because I'm in a hurry, but it's like you got know, you gotta. Well, from our my standpoint, it's like you you've gotta like let those toxins kind of finish clearing out because they while they were dumping, they were influencing things. So you gotta yes. give it a little little time. Okay, well I know there was a question that came in before we did this call. It's a little off topic, but we don't care. It's about the puffy tongue. I think you sent me that question. Puffy tongue. Me. I think you said, well, the question was about what does that puffy tongue mean. I guess somewhere in your teachings you say it's uh, poor digestion or something like that. Um, it's interesting because we talk about puffy tongue in Chinese medicine. Yeah, too, well, you so. say. Cause I'm like, yeah, what do you guys say? I'm curious. I mean, it's like puffy with what? Puffy with inflammation, puffy with lymphatic congestion. Like where? Well, right? I mean, yeah, so, yeah, it's interesting because things like, I would say it is lymphatic congestion. That's not obviously a Chinese medicine term, but if, Often we have historical terms with some modern terms. So I would say it is lymphatic congestion. Um, it's stagnation, and it, your tongue's a little muscle, so I tell people. And if it's bloated, it's probably going on in other places. And often what creates that stagnation and bloating and things not moving is things being kind of stuck and not working in our digestive tract. Um, so... But at the same time, I think some of the tongue shows our nature to like, like I have a puffy tongue and it's sort of my nature that when I work, like stress goes to my digestion, right? So mm -hmm. some of it is sort of my inborn pat habits. I don't know if I'll ever have a skinny, skinny tongue. <laughs> um, but at the same time, like, I think it's an indicator for me or for other people like, oh, your digestion is a system that you really need to take take care of. It's a, a system that's uh, a little more fragile for you. So that's what I would say. What would you say? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you there. Exactly. It's like what you see on the tongue is representing every, you know, it's just representing the, the physiology. So we look at like parts, is it like the whole tongue throughout? Is it more in the front, et cetera? And then colors, like is it more white, is it more red, uh, is it wet, or is it dry? So, you know, like a lot of those other factors then give, then it's like, then there's dry, if it's dry, then there's dryness in other places. If it's wet, there's wetness in other places, right? If there's little bubbles on top of the puffiness, then, then there's like little bubbles in other places, if you will. There's that sort of like excess wateriness. Uh, and so just knowing like froth, right? Some people have frothy, frothy, puffy tongues. Some people have cracked puffy tongue. So there's just, there's just a lot going on. I think just looking into, uh, even just Google uh, Ayurveda tongue map or Chinese medicine tongue map and just start to get a sense of, oh, okay, this is, or I, actually you guys can just email info at yogahealer.com and we'll send you a tongue map uh, that I've made for, it's in Body Thrive. We'll just send you the PDF of that. Uh, but yeah, it's so fun to explore your tongue and get to know like, okay, the qualities <laughs> on my tongue are telling me what's going on everywhere else. Okay. Yeah. I think that person was curious. And I know you have tongues, tongue scraping in the body fight, fight, live program. It does take some time to learn the tongue stuff. Um, I so. recommend it actually like, and if you have the book, just print the page with the tongue map. Um, or actually if you go to, where is it on, on body thrive, 
you can get the handouts somewhere. Just poke around on Body Thrive, and there's a link that you can get the handouts that go with with Body Thrive, and there's a tongue map in there. Just print that out, that one page out, and and tape it to your bathroom mirror, and buy a tongue scraper uh, at the grocery store, or the pharmacy, or the drugstore, or Whole Foods. Stainless steel is best, but if all you can get your hands on is a plastic one for now, like so be it till you get a good one. They cost like eight bucks, and and every morning. Stick out your tongue before you drink water, scrape it, um, and then notice like what came off. What does it look like? Look at your tongue chart and just notice like the one thing that you notice, the one thing like cracks or um, tremors or the shape. Uh, and just notice that one thing and you'll start to build, you'll start to build your language skills around tongue reading. Mm. Cool. Cool. Well, uh, I think I'm going to close it up. I don't see any new questions and we've gone going cool. on a while here yeah. so i'm like well, you great. get on with your day but yeah thanks so much and everybody will show those links earlier we'll show them one more time this is the coaching program link you click on that to, to learn more and apply like Kate said and then the book link is here we'll show that one more time and thanks so much i really i my favorite part was that I forced me to read your book. <laughs> I really, really like the information. I'm super psyched about it. I'm going to see if my husband and son want to start this experiment with me and uh, do, do it together. So, uh, yeah, super, super great concepts that I haven't and really aren't being presented elsewhere. So thanks so much, Kate, for your work. Oh, thanks for recognizing it, Bridget. I really appreciate it. And really good to yeah, talk yeah. with you and your peeps. So thanks for the invite. Yeah, likewise. And thanks for everyone who, who was live. We, again, appreciate your time in the middle of the day here or the middle of the night. We're spending it where you are. And uh, please keep in touch with Kate. She's got a great podcast. What's it say? Is that telling the name again? Yoga oh, Yoga Healer. Healer. So if you just type Yoga Healer into any podcast engine, one okay. word, Yoga Healer. Uh, yeah, on Mondays we have the Real Life Show, and on Thursdays we have Dharma and Dollars, where we talk about like life purpose and money and stuff like that. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Until next time, bye. Bye. <laughs>